Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager and Julie Hartman. Dennis and Julie, welcome. Do you have any idea what number we're up to? <laughs> we're well over 100, right? Yes. Yes, we hit 100. And we've hit two years of doing this show. So, And we yay. didn't miss, correct? We've with, never missed with a week. all my travels. And ever-growing my travels. That's right. Ever-growing your travels. I hope I got you speech in Fairbanks, Alaska, by the way. I told oh. you I'm working on it. I didn't tell you. No, I don't believe you did. Uh, uh, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm saying it'll well, happen. that's very nice. Well, I got to tell you, I, this is a perfect example of the last thing I thought we'd talk about. I remember it as one of the great, I would say, five moments of my life. The first time some group flew me to give a speech. This happened to me... Uh, well, in Seattle, was it Seattle? It was. It was in Northern Washington yeah, State. Yeah, right. the, about a year ago. It was so fun, really, really fun. Mine was Louisville, Kentucky, and I went to Oklahoma. It happened again, and I went to Washington D.C. So it's happened a few times, but yeah, the first one was Washington. Hold on one second. It, wait, 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 wait. I want to get this right. Uh, was it Louisville? No, Nashville. It was I, ironic. Nashville, Tennessee. Sorry, Nashville. I was invited by a group. I was 20, uh, 21 or 22 years old. And all I thought of, they didn't pay me a penny. They just, but they paid the airfare. I was, I, this kid from Brooklyn, which is how I still think of myself. <laughs> this kid from Brooklyn is being brought to Nashville, Tennessee, which sounded so exotic to a New Yorker. By the way, to a New Yorker, everything is exotic because <laughs> New York, is th their belief is the center of the world. So everything else is exotic. <laughs> and I, I just remember on the plane thinking, wow, I'm at 22 or whatever I was, I'm being flown. I opined on a recent Dennis and Julie that as much as I want to see all of the world, if I could, I would see every single corner of the world. Uh, and I know you've seen maybe not every corner, but 80% 80, 80 of, of every corner. Yeah. But I opine that that I also want to see my own country. Oh, definitely. You know? I've been to all 50 states, as I told you. Which is really cool. And people, yes. look, you know, obviously going to Rome or something or going to Florence oh, no. is very... It's, it's a very worthy idea. But I really want to see my country. Yes. Because when I, when I traveled to... Washington State. It was my first time when I traveled to Oklahoma. It was my first time, and I learned a lot. Like when I was in Oklahoma, in, about the people, about the way that people live. When I was in in Washington State, I learned about all the different um, tribal areas, Native American areas. Like wh when would an LA kid see that, you know? And then in Oklahoma, you you'll love this. One day, uh, there was a few hours until my my speech, and I thought, what am I going to do? I was alone, you know, in Oklahoma for the next like five hours. And in Oklahoma City, they had these scooters just lying around. Oh, perfect. By the way, Oklahoma City is so clean. It's like. I'm not surprised. Beautifully clean. Like, I barely right. saw any homeless people. Like, it was really cool. So I got on a scooter and I just zipped around. And guess what I happened upon? The Oklahoma City bombing memorial. Mm -hmm. And I looked at all of. And, and that. It was so. I actually think that everyone should go see the Oklahoma City bombing memorial sometime in their, in their lives if they can. Have you been? No. It's the the memorial looks a lot like 9/11. Obviously, the Oklahoma City bombing predated 9/11, but like it looks. I meant the 9/11 memorial, um, and the way that you know the, the twin towers they have that steel and, and the fountain going mm -hmm. in. There's that same steel. They have chairs of all of the people who died on um, grass. It's a very stirring thing. And sorry, I know I'm going on and on about this, but I'll say one thing. I remember there was this huge tribute wall at the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial, and I walked up to it, and I just read some of it. And I could, I could cry talking about it right now. There was a letter that, they, that someone posted on the, on the wall and it was a letter to this person's mom who died in the in the mm. bombing. And the person, you mm. know, wrote, 
dear mom, I'm, I miss you every day. You know, you, you would be so proud of me. And mm. I, I mm. just had my second baby. She reminds me so much of you. And, you know, they put the photos up. And what was that, like 1994, 1995, that Oklahoma City bombing? And I know this is a colossally obvious thing to say, but you just really get a sense of all those years later, that trauma for those families is just as raw as it was. Well, that's then. why I'm for capital punishment. Yeah. I think that opponents of capital punishment in general, always exceptions, are not as aware of the heinousness of murder as I am. Well, there are two things that I have to give you credit for alerting me to with regard to the capital punishment and murder issue. These are the two most compelling arguments that you've given for capital punishment. The first is, in one of your books that I read, I can't remember which one, but you you quoted a caller who called into your show and said uh, that her uh, son or husband or, or some family member was murdered. And apparently the caller said, I support capital punishment because why did my son get the death penalty, but the murderer didn't? Yep, that's I, right. That is so, it's absolutely right. The, the victim right. got the death penalty, uh, the yes. murderer gets to live? Well, no, no. When, when I talk to people who are against capital punishment, all I want them to say, and then I have intellectual respect for them, even though I continue to differ with them, do you acknowledge how unjust it is that if I take your life deliberately, I get to keep my own. Do, do you at least acknowledge that is unjust? If you do, then I know you think clearly. It's like I ask atheists when I debate them. The first question, do you hope you're right or do you hope you're wrong? <laughs> yes. If they hope they're right, then they're, they haven't thought the issue through. That's exactly what it is. It doesn't mean they're a bad person, but they haven't thought it through. And the capital punishment one is, do you acknowledge it's a cosmic injustice that the murderer gets to live and the, the victim is dead? I mean, okay, you may say, well, we can make a mistake and, uh, and, and you know, it's not for us to take a lie. You, all your, your arguments, which every, all of them are, are uh, in, to my mind, answerable. Uh, but at least I can then respect their arguments. But if they think, it's like, do, I would ask someone, do you at least acknowledge it is unjust for a male who says he's a female to compete with women in women's sports? Right. If you at least acknowledge that, then we could move on with the discussion. Mm -hmm. But if you can't see that, we have no dialogue. If you think it is just that the person who murdered, what did, what did that, that human re r rubbish kill 165 people 168 168 people and he and and he doesn't get put to death i mean that's fair okay don't start me <laughs> well i was going to say welcome to dennis and julie we're five minutes in we had no idea we we're going to discuss this and we're on capital punishment but i'll tell you the second the the second argument that you've you highlighted uh, that made a huge impression on me and then i have a interesting question for you on that the second argument is from the Cain and Abel story. And this is this is why, shameless plug, he never asked me to do this. I do this so willingly because I believe this book is life-changing. Shameless plug for the Rational Bible. It is so unbelievably life-changing, and here's one example. In the Cain and Abel story, you translate the Hebrew to 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 highlight that, that it says that um, Cain killed the bloods of Abel. Right. It literal is the bloods of uh, of your brother are crying out to me. It's almost never translated accurately. It always says it always says the blood, but in Hebrew, it's and the the word is almost never used bloods like it isn't in English, but it is there. This is why it's so life changing. Not only because of the way that you explain things, but because you have such a impressive knowledge of Hebrew that you're able to make distinctions like that and that makes all the difference in the story because thanks to your understanding of the Hebrew I had this and you highlight it this profound revelation when you're when you're killing someone 
you don't just take one life. Mm. You take all of the descendants that would have come after them. And you don't just ruin one life. Well, exa- well certainly. It, That's it, why you mentioned the, the, the suffering ongoing uh, from Oklahoma City to this day. So I have a question for you. Apropos of this blood's point, and I, I support capital punishment, is it unfair to kill a murderer because of the bloods that would come after them? The bloods that they, the, the children that they could oh, potentially that's a very reproduce. Inst- no, I understand. Or for their children, you know, right. their children, even though obviously if their father or mother is a murderer, they have get, been given terrible luck. But to ha- for, the, for the children's sake and right. the, so, the bloods uh, argument in that right. category. The, the, I, I, off the top of my head, a good answer would be. It is not our fault that the progeny would not be reproduced. It's his fault, the murderers. Right, but we have the Just, power to control. Yeah, well, we. so the same thing in, with the bombing of Hiroshima. Yeah. I mean, talk, talk about bloods. Yes. Talk well, about not just bloods, lineages but, being... You know, wiped out. It, we had the power whether or not to kill those innocents, but it... We're not responsible. The, the Japanese government is responsible for the Japanese dead. And the German government for the German dead and Hamas for the Palestinian dead. But that we, we live in, in such a morally obtuse age compared to the past. In the past, the, the citizens of the, of the free countries knew it's Hitler's fault that Germans are being killed. It's, it's the Japanese emperor's fault and Tojo's fault that the Japanese are being killed. It's not the Allies' fault. Mm. But all of a sudden, it's Israel's fault. Well, as I say, with, uh, and, and that's absolutely true, but on this Israel point, I made an observation recently on my show about the general kind of outrage that is funneled at certain world events. And I may have brought this up on Dennis and Julie, so I won't spend too much time on it, but it's a really important point. And it's that here we have Haiti, which has descended into barbaric gang violence by many reports cannibalism. Haitians are lining up in droves for a lottery visa to come to the United States. We have China massacring Uyghur Muslims. We, perhaps not now, but certainly in the recent past, have Hutus and Tutsis massacring each other and sectarian violence in the Middle East between well, Sunnis Hutus and Shias. Ma- and- ma- Hutus massacring Tutsis. But go right, on. Yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you for that distinction. And Dennis Prager here with a man I have come to admire for his work. So when I asked him, what do you do? This is the title he gave. Wealth architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work. And you have, in fact, saved me a serious amount of money. CharlesDombeck.com slash Prager. Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. I mean, the list goes on and on. In West Africa, Christians are being killed. 60,000 murdered by Muslim terrorists. By Muslim terrorists, that's right. Uh, You know, the genital mutilation. I mean, Ayan Hirsi Ali talks about this from from her own experience, you know. I mean, just the, the, the evil that is done all around the world. And yet, speaking in broad strokes, what does the media care about? What do woke people care about? What are woke people protesting at the San Francisco airport? And what did someone who self-immolated and I was horrifically sad in front of the you know Israeli embassy, what are they focusing on? Israel. And by the way, we can have a big discussion about this. Obviously, I'm not saying people shouldn't be focusing on what's happening in Israel. There's a war. Innocents are dying. It's very important to focus on. 
but it's just it's just revelatory to me that given all the evil in the world that's where the major attention is and the answer for, for why that is is because they know it can be spun to their political benefit they only care I'm talking about these crazy woke people, when they can point and go white country, and I'm putting in quotation marks white because obviously Israel is half non-white, but they only care when they can go, look, white oppressing non-white. They don't care when it's non-white killing or oppressing non-white. By the way, we see that here in the United States with crime. 98% of all black homicide victims are killed by other blacks, but no one gives a damn when it's a black killing a black in the inner street they give a damn when it's a white killing a black because they want to, you know, froth up the political narrative. That is that is morally sick to me. Black lives ma- all lives matter regardless of who is oppressing or killing them. We should give equal attention to to all suffering. Well, I couldn't say it better. The the isolation of Israel or as Chuck Schumer put it in his awful speech, well, there were a lot of good parts of the speech, but the punchline was awful, and that is, Israel, vote out your prime minister. Did, it, did, did an American leader ever tell a democracy? Uh, 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 anyone in that high a position, the Senate majority leader, we want you to get rid of your democratically elected leader? Okay, so... Here's the answer. Israel is the pariah state of the world, just like Chuck Schumer said. So you have, you, every meaning everyone, has a choice. Either the world is evil or Israel is evil. It's got to be one or the other. If the world is right, Israel is a, deserves to be the pariah state of planet Earth. Mm-hmm. By the way, do you know that Israel has been condemned in the United Nations more often than any other country in the United Nations? More often than communist China, more often than the Russia, Nations more often scum. than this. It is, totally. It's total it's scum. My whole life. And, and now they, they come out and announce it, it looks like genocide. It's a total lie. It's a gigantic lie. It's A lot of people doesn't equal genocide. There are five times as many Palestinians now as there were when Israel was formed. Is that genocide? I mean, they, what, all they've done is, and I use the word deliberately, raped the word genocide. That is what the left has done, and the United Nations is, is has been woke since before the word was invented. I wish the UN left the United States. I, I, I wish the UN were situated uh, in, in an Arab country. Mm. That that would be that would be, or, or a Muslim country. That would be terrific. That, you know, they run the UN anyway. 52 Muslim states, they, they tell the General Assembly how to vote. Because that block, there's no, there's no comparable block. So, so let, let them move there. That's all. You know, we're, we're moving to Syria. We're moving to Iraq. Great. I, I, I would help pay the, uh, moving, the moving funds. So who's, who is, so really, one's the villain, Israel or the world? And by the way, it's not the world. Vast numbers of individuals know that Israel is in the right. Vast numbers. That's why I don't know who said it, but I can't take credit for it. And you know I'm a big one on giving credit for because something Because the Talmud I quote. says that you bring righteousness to the world when right, you cite a source. Right, that's right. Redemption to be. Oh, redemption. But that doesn't matter. You're right. And uh, in this regard, someone said it's not the United Nations. It's the United Governments. It's a very, very important distinction. Hmm. That's what's that's what is in the U the UN United Governments. See, the thing about the UN is there is some benefit, keyword some, to having countries fight like having having a forum where people can just fight with each other. Honestly, I, I think that to an extent that's helpful. But the United Nations is so morally confused and so, um, as you said, w- was woke before the, the term was even invented. I mean, recently, obviously, there was that ceasefire vote. I mean, <laughs> the, the whole thing, in addition to, be mo- to being morally reprehensible, was just intellectually stupid. This is what I often say when, when you and I are on my show, I profile like woke 
you know, absurdities, woke arguments that people make. Like we, we were talking on Dennis and Julie about that NFL coach who said, if you don't see, if you if you don't see race, then you're oh yeah, you're a racist. You're racist. That's the definition of racism. And and with those statements, like I just look at them and go, in right. addition to being wrong, they're literally just intellectually right. stupid. So you're let's right. look at this United Nations vote recently. At the time of the filming, it was recent, um, where in the United States abstained, which we should talk about, uh, where they had basically two provisions. One is an immediate ceasefire, and then another one is like, oh by the way, we want the hostages to be released. Right, but they were not conjoined. But it was not condition the the ceasefire w- a condition. Of the ceasefire was not that if there is a ceasefire, the hostages need That's to be right. released. Yes, it is. It's just amazing to me yeah. how how um, again, it's just like it's so stupid. In addition to being wrong. So do you know? I don't know if I. I hope I didn't mention this on Dennis and Julie. I mean, it's worth it's worth mentioning again, but I hope I didn't mention it. <laughs> I can tell you if you did. I know. What the, in the book of Numbers in the Bible, the pagan prophet Balaam, he, what he said about Israel? No. Oh, good. See, this this is why I see these things in religious terms, because they are. The isolation of Israel is 100% related to the fact that it's Jewish, 100%. Muslims commit the greatest atrocities on the face of the earth in terms of any religion. Christians and Jews don't come close, and you hear nothing about Islam. Israel is defending itself against people who wish to murder and rape every Israeli they can, mm-hmm. and and Israel is is the contemptible nation on the on the planet. This so there's there's a great story. It's going to come out in my numbers book. The story basically is there's a. Uh, a king named Balak, B-A-L-A-K, and he hires this prophet Balaam, B-A-L-A-A-M, in Hebrew, Balaam, Balaam in English, and he says to him, I want you to curse Israel. That, that was his big thing. Well, I'll pay you a fortune. I'll give you all that you want. I'll make you the richest man in my kingdom, but I want you to curse Israel. And Balaam doesn't. Because he, he actually seems to believe in, in, in the one God. But he does utter statements about Israel. And one of them is one of the most famous statements about the Jewish people in the Bible. Um, I'm, again, I have to always do this from the Hebrew. So, And so this people, this is a people that will dwell alone and not be counted among the nations of the earth. Hmm. That was that was about 3,000 years ago. <laughs> Nothing has changed. It is a people that dwells alone. The aloneness of the Jew during the Holocaust, as one writer once put it, the world was divided between countries that murder Jews and countries that wouldn't allow them in. And that's that's exactly what happened. And again, the alone, lonely, aloneness of the Jew, and you are now seeing it again. Israel is described by various experts on on warfare as the most mor- most moral army that has ever existed. The the most recent person to say that is the head of the Urban Warfare Institute at West Point. Not a Jewish guy, a major American uh, um, a guy. He did two tours in, in Iraq. He, he's very high up in the army, and he teaches as the head of this institute. He said, there's no, there's no army as moral as Israel. The, the head of British forces in Afghanistan, a, not, a non-Jew, a non-American, uh, and, and loyal to his own country, but says Israel is the most moral army that has ever existed. And that's the most hated army in the world today. The most hated. Is China hated? Look at China has just squashed Hong Kong. It, it's it's taken it and, and made it into silly putty. Look at what they're doing to Uyghur Muslims. And to Look Uyghur Muslims. Look at what Muslims. they do to their own citizens. And it means nothing. Look at what they're doing to the United States with fentanyl. It means nothing. 
That's right. It means nothing. Or Mao killed 60 million of his people, and he was honored at the UN. They gave him a seat on the Security Council. Oh, it was it was Taiwan that was on the Security Council till till then. My understanding was that by our the United States recognizing the Communist Party right. as the legitimate government right. of China and not the K- KMT, the Nationalist Chiang yeah. Kai-shek Party. My understanding is that, and I could be totally wrong. Please correct me if I am. That that it was a result of that decision that it was the Chinese Communist Party which had the UN seat. I, I believe that that's true. I'm not. I, I that's right. my understanding. I, yeah, I it could be I wrong. Know, I don't know if you could uh, prove it, but it, it seems almost inevitable. I like many people worry very much for Israel's future, and from the beginning of this this conflict, I have asked. What is the long-term plan here? How is this going to work out long-term for Israel? And look, I, I, so, so often, yeah, we, we discussed recently on Dennis and Julie that people succumb to binaries, that you're either totally 100% you know, supportive of every single thing Israel does, or you're totally 100% supportive of everything that opposes Israel, and you're in those two camps. Obviously, I'm far more in the, the camp of uh, the, the former camp in that I... I, you know how fond I am of my my trip to Israel. You know how much um, I understand the need for a Jewish state. I am reviled by what happened on October 7th. Israel has a right to defend itself. Hamas must be eliminated. But how is this going to eliminate Hamas? Even if they get this invasion of Gaza, even if they get rid of every single member of Hamas, the the Palestine the 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 population is so radicalized and crucially, so much of the world is anti-Israel and has yeah. been further radicalized against Israel. For instance, I, I wrote a piece shortly after October seventh in the American Mind about Turkey, and Turkey under President Erdogan has definitely been. Uh, shifting away from the West. Turkey is a member of NATO. It's like a de facto member of the European Union. Under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the the first president of Turkey 100 years ago, by the way, I did a timeless episode of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He's so interesting. Like he got rid of the the fez and oh, the completely. and the hijab. He was a big he Westerner. He secularized Turkey. He made the Turkish alphabet look like English. Right. But anyway, Erdogan definitely had already been pivoting more towards... You know what Ataturk means? A father of the Turks, yeah. Are you ready to lose weight but not sure where to start? Let me tell you why Dennis chose PhD weight loss and nutrition. First, he says Dr. Ashley Lucas has her PhD in chronic disease and sports nutrition. The program is science-based. The PhD program starts with nutrition, but as Dennis says, there is so much more. They know that 90% of permanent change comes from the mind and they work on eliminating the reasons you gained this weight in the first place. There aren't any shortcuts, pills, injections, just solid science-based nutrition and behavior. Dennis says he has seen results over several weeks. If you're ready to lose weight for the last time, call 1-864-644-1900 to get started or online at myphdweightloss.com. Do what Dennis did and just make the appointment for your one-on-one consultation call today. That's 864-644-1900. Folks, <laughs> look at me. I'm impressed. Well, thank Julie you. Julie works so hard to fill her knowledge base. It's it's truly impressive. Well, that's very kind of you to say thank you, but honest to God, I love it. I it's know, endlessly I know. interesting. Yes, it's endless. I and I view it, it as my life vocation to consume and put it out there because I know. Right, for, it's a great for, vocation. Because people don't have time. I'm, I'm lucky the way, to get so paid er- to learn. Erdogan is undoing the Ataturk revolution. Yes, and Erdogan. I mean, after October seventh, I, I wrote about this. The Turkish parliament. All these Palestinian flags chanting "Free Palestine." I mean, Turkey has been made very anti-Israel as a result of this invasion of Gaza. And I just, I ask this question, and this is not to say to give me any kind of credit at all, but I don't see a lot of people asking this question. What's the long-term plan? 
for Israel? How is this going to work out for them? Okay, we, nobody knows the answer, but I know what they wanted. They want to get rid of Hamas, the, and they're and they're right. They want to get rid of the tunnels. What if what if even I, I answered you that they want to demolish? There are five hundred miles of tunnels. They have spent over one billion dollars on tunnels. Uh, when when Douglas Murray stands in Gaza at the Mediterranean Sea and says, this place could have been Singapore, that is literally accurate. All the money they get from America and the UN, they spend on tunnels. It is the most extensive tunnel system in the history of Earth. It is many feet down, almost impregnable by bombs. That is the reason for Israel bombing, to get to the tunnels. But they put the tunnels under schools and hospitals and mosques. That's the... The, the, every dead Palestinian is a victory for Hamas. Absolutely. Period. There's no but. You're 100% so right. So here is the answer. I, Israel should say this, and, and if, if, if we had a, a government that, that stood up for what is right, it would say it. Hamas, there will be no bombing. The, it will be a permanent ceasefire if you surrender and give up the hostages. Israel has said that. But, but most people don't know that. You know, I'll, I'll be engaging in this big debate, apparently, in Washington, D.C. In, in, in a couple of weeks. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll be very curious to know what my opponents, it's two against two, Zeb Gorka and I, and, and uh, against two, two people. What will they say to that? Do, you, do they know that? Does the average, you know, Harvard student know that if, if Hamas simply uh, gives up... They don't know that. That it's the end of the war? They don't know that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% right, with exactly. you. And it, it is such a problem because if, if you call yourself pro-Palestinian, you should hate Hamas with more further fervor than you hate anything on earth. I mean, they, they are not only right. genocidal pro, with Israel. Pro-Palestinian today means what pro-German meant in 1943. I know. Pro Hitler, but I, I, I'm with you on all of this. They are dis- Hamas is calling them despicable is an insult to the word despicable, for what they do to Israel and what they do to Palestinians. I just ask again, and no. and 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 and, and, and I want to make something really clear. Just as you were talking about Senator Schumer, you know, t- telling them to call for new elections, Israel is its own country. Israel makes its decisions that it and judges to be best. Country. It's a democratic country. a democratic country. They know their situation better than anyone else. I'm not here, you know, instructing people what to do, not that they'd even listen to me. But I am asking a question of how does this how does this work out long term? Because here's another thing. So Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a few months ago, and he's talked about this since, in the Wall Street Journal, published an article three plans for peace. And obviously, you know, these calls for the two-state solution and to give it to the Palestinian Authority is absurd. We saw what happened when that happened. Okay, it's just, Mm -hmm. and again, in addition to being wrong, it's absurd. But he outlined these three points for peace. And, you know, one of, I I don't want to directly quote him, I'm summarizing to the best of my, my memory, but he was essentially like, you know, control, have Israeli control of Gaza until we can de-radicalize the population and essentially make it a state that is not so genocidal towards Israel. But when I was reading that, I was just thinking, and he compared it to, he, the crucial thing is he compared it to Germany and Japan and what happened in the aftermath of mm-hmm. World War II with those populations being denazified and de-radicalized. But there's a huge difference, huge After World War II, Nazi Germany was destroyed. Obviously, Japan with the two atomic bombs was destroyed. Their allies turned on them and were and were done with the war. And the and the world population Mm, was not overwhelmingly. The difference is in this case. The difference is in this. They'll still have Iran. Is that what you're saying? Total, not just Iran. They right. will have they will have Turkey. They will have Iraq. They will have Afghanistan. They will have Saudi Arabia. They'll have half of the United States. They'll have half of you know your crazy woke people in European yeah, they'll countries. Have each other. They'll have China. They'll have Russia. They have most of the world on their side. Yeah, and the U.S. That's a big, big difference. I agree. It's a that's a very good point. 
Israel's in a terrible position. They're but in an impossible situation. It has situation. no choice. If Israel stops fighting, that means that uh, that he- that Hezbollah I was going to say so they're interchangeable. That Hamas has won. That's that's all it means. They got away with October seventh. Well, what you said to me because we were talking about the um, at the time of this filming, perhaps impending invasion of of Rafa, and I said to you, you know, what what do you what do you think about that? And you said if they don't do it, every life lost will have been in vain. Yes. And I and again, I I have sympathy for that argument of I really do, but I, I don't think this is going to work out long term for Israel. The oh, that if they taking. were allowed to do what they, if they were allowed to do, it would. Do you really think? Do you really? Yeah, and I, 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 they, and they cannot say, oh, America is now, uh, the president and the Democratic Party are now against us. We're going to stop fighting. That ends Israel as its own entity. That is as almost a, as big a defeat for Israel as not fighting Hamas. To accept the notion. Yeah, if America says commit suicide, we're going to commit suicide. Again, and Israelis feel this way. By the way, how many people know this? Did, do you know this? The vast majority of the money America gives Israel, Israel then spends on American weapons. I didn't know that. No. Yes. No, it's unbelievable to me how rarely it's reported. People should all check it out. The great majority of money, it's not money sent to Israel and Israel does what it wants. It then buys American weapons. It's essentially a funneling of money in, into uh, our military uh, companies. And, uh, but by the way, I'm glad they're making the weapons. I'm, uh, this is not an attack on those companies. Whether or not there is a military industrial complex, the fact is the world needs America's arms. And certainly Israel does. But Israel is going to fight. Israel is not going to accept suicide because Joe Biden is afraid of losing Michigan to Arab voters. Uh, of course, completely agree with you here. And and what you just said, and, and I repeated, is so true. I mean, Israel is in an impossible situation. Well, it's been rendered impossible by, by the yes. weak, cowardly, and evil world. Yes. But nevertheless, here they stand in this That's impossible right. situation. And, and, and they are prepared to go it alone. But as it, as Balaam chapter, I don't remember what chapter. I think it's 25. It's okay that you don't remember what chapter. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> the fact you even remember it by heart is in the Hebrew. So impressive. But let's say Israel defeats Hamas in the Gaza Strip. And let's say that they have a, and this is what they're saying, they're probably going to do, have a military uh, joint or total military occupation of Gaza and launch an effort to de-radicalize the population. Because the population, as we know from the whole UNRWA scandal, and as we knew even before October 7th, they are literally taught every single day to despise Jews, despise the West, to believe all of these crazy lies. But let's say that happens. Let's say there's a military occupation of Gaza and the population there is de-radicalized. Do you think that's a, do you think that's that will work out long-term for Israel? So, since you gave the analogy of Hitler's Germany, let's say, mm-hmm. we denazified Germany. Nazism was more of a blip on the German radar than Hamas is a blip on the, on the Muslim Arab radar. Yep. Is, you understand exactly what I said. Was it, you think it's clear to everybody? Yes, it was the point that I was making earlier about how, you know, the whole world was against, well, the whole world at the time of um, of the end of World War II was generally very much against Japan and Germany. And the the Nazism in Germany, to your point, it hadn't existed for decades right. and that, hundreds of years right. hitler was was rose to power in 1933 Islam has existed yes since muhammad it's not all of islam of but course not. it has right israel's in a bad neighborhood well israel's in I a bad israel were between let's say belgium and netherlands so uh, no, nobody would try to destroy it it would just 
though? Well, you know, after World War II, you know, because because obviously in the Balfour Declaration in, in 1917, the British designated Israel. Right. By the way, it wasn't called Palestine then, was it? Or it, yes, it, was, it was called Palestine. Yeah, That's but, right. but again, there was no country named Palestine. Right. Palestine was a geographical area like North America. Palestine is to that area what North America is to our area. Obviously, it's because of, you know, the Jews have existed in the land of Israel for thousands of years. There's right the religious i i don't use the religious homeland argument me neither i i, I just think it's a losing argument i agree but, with you but for thousands of years it is absolutely yes, true jews, the jews o- and the only two states that ever exist there were both jews right jewish states jews were there before islam was even founded the jews were there before christianity was founded yes well exactly <laughs> um because jesus was obviously born in uh, bethlehem but um uh, what was I going to say? Oh, gosh. Bingo. Dennis and Julie, bingo. What was it? Oh, yes, yes. That was fast. That was a fast recovery. Well, you know why? You taught me this. You put it at the, bra- the word a in word. your brain? I love I love that. Oh, when I give Jules a, a good tip. It's like a stock tip. <laughs> this is, but this it's one's better a really than a good stock tip. Because... By the way, let's just tell everybody yeah. what it is. It's really worth knowing because I speak ev- virtually every day. I speak publicly. And it's very easy if you're not reading your speech, which I never have in, in my life. If you're not reading your speech, it's very easy to forget a point you make, especially if you make a side point, And I always make side points. Dennis and Julie's side because point Because they're hour. interesting and relevant. Yes. But what I so what I do is I, I I I can't say literally, but close to literally, I say a word, and that word I go back to when I have completed the thought of the other idea. Otherwise, I will lose a uh, track. So you, you, I was. I'm happy I asked you. How did you recover so quickly? Oh, it's, okay, ev- it's so, everything. That, yes. Think of the word of your point, That's and right. then you'll come back yes. to it. Remember that word. So I remember so my the, point. Uh, and it was yo-yo. <laughs> my word? Yeah. Yeah. It was shrimp. Shrimp. That's what it was. Okay. If you're still waiting to buy gold, sitting on the sidelines could cost you precious gains. This is Julie Hartman for AmFed Coin and Bullion, Dennis's choice for precious metals. The current economic climate could make buying gold a very desirable safe haven commodity. The government's overprinting of money, the fluctuation of interest rates, and high inflation can impact the value of gold. And that's why you should seriously consider buying now. Dennis has been working with AmFed Coin and Bullion's owner, Nick Grovich, for years. And he says that he is so glad that he jumped into precious metals market when he did. Nick has been in the industry for over 42 years, and he's proud of providing transparency and fair pricing to build long-term relationships. Nick and his team have always had Dennis's back, he says. Dennis recommends what's in his best interest. And he doesn't worry about AmFed Coin and Bullion's hidden commissions or huge markups. If you're interested in buying or selling, call AmFed Coin and Bullion for a free coin performance review. 1-800-221-7694, AmericanFederal.com, AmericanFederal.com. No, you ha- you make a word that's associated with what you're going to say. And um, so my question was, well, obviously, you know, Israel was the the designated homeland because the Jews had been there for thousands of years and the religious argument, although you and I do not make that argument. But I'm just curious. It's, it's interesting to consider why after World War II, because you just said Israel's in a bad neighborhood. It would have been better situated if it were between Belgium and the Netherlands. Why didn't, especially as a form of reparation to the Jews, Germany or another country partition off a part of their territory to give Ju- to the Jews Jewish homeland? Jews didn't want to stay in Europe. Jews wanted to go back home. That's it. It's it's as simple as that. If it, if the only issue were safety, although I have to admit, I'm not sure that a Jew in 1945 oh, absolutely. thought, oh, Europe is really yeah, safe. Yeah, exactly. They're going to give us a part of our land and have all of yeah. us here. Antarctica no, is safe would, for Jews. Right. 
Greenland seems to have very little anti-Semitism. But I, I think this point that we're that we're talking about is honestly incredibly depressing, but really important because even if Israel by its metrics su- succeeds in this war, occupying Gaza, eliminating every member, every 30,000 you know, member of Hamas and de-radicalizing the population in that area, I still don't see an end to, to, to this problem for Israel. The problem of, of terror and these exporters it, of evil yes. trying to eradicate Israel. Well, so that's it, not gonna go it away. It won't end terror. But it will make October 7th much less likely. You think? Oh, yeah. I do. If Israel governs uh, uh, Gaza again, yeah. And so does Israel think that. But we've seen so this. So do the in, Gazans think but that. But we've seen this in the past. I mean, we've seen with no. the six day, We've seen right. Israel, and it doesn't make those events more likely. Well, no. So so each one has its own explanation. The six, the, you, you mean really the Yom Kippur War. Are you, so take any war. I mean, I'll I'll I'll, I'll explain it to you. Uh, you know them anyway. Yeah, I, I you've done no, so I, much but homework. I, but I okay. So I want to understand. Israel was taken by surprise in ni- 1973. Uh, so that would be seven years, six years after the Six Day War. By the way, on October sixth, 1973. Did you know that? And this was October seventh. And this was October seventh, 2023. 50 years exactly after the Yom Kippur War. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fact check that Yeah, right no, now. I think you're right. Because it was Yom Kippur, and this was uh, Shemchat Torah, both Jewish holidays. Now, deliberately so, obviously. They know that... Yep, October 6, 1973. Yeah. I'm surprised it hasn't been more made. It's 50 years to the day. To the 12, 24 hours a day. I think you should just say to people... Briefly, but nevertheless, it's worthy, even though you have, you visited Israel. You've been there once, right? I've been there once, yes. You, and I hope you, to go back so many times. You were profoundly moved. Absolutely. I think, see. Profoundly. It changed my is, life. Israel Hamas is, is good at, versus evil as clearly as it ever existed. You're absolutely right. You're, you're totally right. But you were saying, we were talking about how is this going to work out long term? And you said you think that it will make October 7th less yes, likely. And I uh, challenged yes, you by saying, right. has history revealed Well, yes, history has. That? The, the, the Israel was a, a thousand, I think a thousand Israelis were killed in, te- in the cumulative terror attacks. So Israel built a wall, but barrier between itself and uh, and the West Bank Palestinians. And it cut down terror by like 95%. If Israel governs uh, Gaza, then it will cut down terror. It, it will not eliminate it, but it will... Obviously, on October 7th, couldn't happen again. And, and but people don't know that Hamas has announced it's going to do October 7th as much as it can. I know, so that's why I'm a little surprised yes. that you say that no, it's, it's going to make them is, less likely. If Israel governs Hamas, if excuse me, uh, Gaza, it will render this less likely. Just as you, I think earlier this episode, you said when you ask atheists, um, do they do they hope that they're wrong? Mm-hmm. And they say yes, you know that they're <laughs> intellectually honest. intellectually honest, and right? they thought the issue through. What I, I'm about to say, I hope. I'm wrong. I hope I am dead wrong right now, and I hope you are intellectually schooling me, and you're right. I don't think I'm wrong. I don't. I. I you know, I, in other words, you don't think I, anything I, will help. I don't think this is going to go away. Yes, I. It won't go away. And I, in fact, but, I think it's going to get worse. Even if Israel wins. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, Israel doesn't think so, and I don't think so. And guess what? If you're if no, you're no, you right, you hope I'm right. I know that. Of course, it'll understand. be the happiest yeah. day of my life no, no, if I, you're right. I, 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 well, one of the happiest. That's true. I'm looking forward to your happiest day. Yes, I think we both are I, thinking of the I, same thing. Yes, I hope I. <laughs> You'll be officiating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> By the That's way, so, so on to a totally different thing. 
are you are you uh, okay. yeah yeah I, i'll just say quickly I, the reason why is because of all of the global anti-israel hatred right. and the united states which used to be israel's staunchest ally half of us are are vehemently anti-israel and then with the ascent of china and russia and right. now no, a cash flush it, iran it, under joe biden it, that's why i said the world bleak. the world is awful the world is morally disgusting yeah Israel's a decent country, ladies and gentlemen. That it's the pariah of nations shows it only reflects on the nations, not on Israel. That's why I made that point, and I'll, I make it over and over. I'll make it when I debate these two these two guys. By the way, my uh, my debate with uh, a, a pro Palestinian is up. Uh, I was on a, on um, Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan to. 10 days ago or so, whatever, two days. It's that was a just, really, really good interview. Yeah, a, a, a debate. debate. Well, yeah, yeah, debate, yeah, interview, yeah. whatever. Anyway, it's worth folks seeing, so I, I, I forget to mention that. So, so let's uh, talk about my wedding. <laughs> yes, I am, actually. It, it led me to say something, because uh, I am asked on occasion about, you know, have I made plans for... Uh, my death, basically. <laughs> People ask. Jolly. You know, hey, look, we, it, we've talked about this on Dennis and uh, Julie. Yes. And, uh, you know. It's a part of life. That's right. That's exactly right. And and I, I, I have the most blessed life that I can imagine. I can literally imagine. I mean, that, I, I always, I tell this, I'm very open, uh, as you know, that my career remains on the ascendant at my age it's almost, it's virtually unheard of. I mean, it's it's more successful today than 10 years ago. 10 years ago was more than 20. 20 was more than 30. 30 was more than 40. I mean, I, I, it's incredible. Congratulations. I, 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 well, you're right. It, 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 and, and, and it's I, a massive good fortune. But anyway, uh, you're, you're, one, you're a big factor finding you because I, I I see so you as nice. carrying on my message in your generation oh, and, and I I'm saying it on video as proof it can if should anybody ask I hope you're not the only one but uh, I don't know anybody who's gonna do it better and uh, I, Thank you so I, much. I, I, well, it's not even a compliment. It's a compliment, but it's not meant to be a compliment. I just want to assert it publicly. I take it very seriously. Oh, I know you do. I know you do. I, I thank God I found you. But I, I do want to just say, though, in light of, uh, I really, really do monitor my health and, and, and my genes. And you go to your workout classes and you're kicking guess, and screaming. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> and, and I, I even had a test. People don't even know this exists. I read about it in the Wall Street Journal. It was fascinating. A guy's life was saved by this test. They, it's a test for cancer cells in your body. It's a blood test. It's, it's about $1,000. And they acknowledge, you know, we may miss it, but obviously they have to say that. You can't sue them if you then get cancer, and it, as it should be. But the article in the Wall Street Journal was about a man who had no clue he had pancreatic cancer. One of the worst cancers you could have. The survival rate is so low. But they caught it thanks to this $1,000 blood test, $949, I think it was. And they caught it because they have a test of the blood. They take your blood, obviously. And uh, either way, you're thrilled you took the test. Yes. If you're clean, you're thrilled. And if they found something, you're not happy you have it, but you're thrilled that they found it. That you know. His life was saved. Because if you get even pancreatic cancer early enough, they save your life. Wow. So anyway, I just want to note, I got a totally clean bill of health on that. Then I went for a, a brain scan at a doctor I'm going to have on the show. The guy's a genius. And he, he just gave me my report and... He said, you know, I have, a, I have a young man's brain. He's, there is not even a, a hint of any future dementia. And he spoke about decades of more life from, from the brain aspect, how healthy the brain was. And so 
uh, my parents lived a very long life and they were healthy till the end. So uh, since this arises every so often in people who like me, uh, those, it, by the way, it arises in people who hate me too. That's true. They're just rooting for the, the, the data hasten. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'm just, it's, I just want to report I have a really good bill of health. And, you know, anything could happen. Look, Joe Lieberman, whom I knew very well, by yes. the way. May he rest He fell. Peace. By the way, that I do fear. I, I don't fear a heart attack. I don't fear uh, cancer. And they're both possible. But I, I falling, and first of all, you could fall at any age. You just trip on something. But I have fallen a, f- a fair number of times. Uh, and uh, thank God, no, nothing permanent in any of those. But apparently it killed Joe Lieberman. Oh. He, he was fine. Did you know that that was the I reason? I didn't know. So, by the way, I said he was just 82. That, by the way, is not a silly comment any longer. If I read you're 82 and die, I look as to the... If you're 92 and die, I never... I assume 92 killed you. But this is an interesting point I'm making. We have gotten to the point where if you're 82, people no longer assume, oh, he died because he was 82. What a blessing that is. No, it's huge. Huge blessing. But, But in your age, at 92, you will ask... What happened? You won't assume it was old age. Well, you're not wood, but it'll be very interesting. Uh, and, and, and I have no answer, and I won't be around for, for when you're that old, God willing, that you'll be that old. But it'll it'll give, it, it's a blessing and a curse because it's going to give people more time to be alone. There, Americans are alone at 40. They don't get less alone at 80. They get more alone at 80. So what's going to be at 90 and 100? It's, you know, you I ev- almost every week I read another column somewhere not having friends commu- and community is like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Mm. They, they give this analogy. Wow. I want you to know, Julie, 40 years ago on the radio, in, in, in my early 30s, I was telling people, you should date for friends like you dated for a spouse. Dennis Prager here with a man I have come to admire for his work. So when I asked him, what do you do? This is the title he gave, Wealth Architect. Very simply put, I am a wealth architect that helps my clients accelerate the way they grow your wealth. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. The Internal Revenue Code is embedded with a number of things that you can take advantage of. It's what I call playing tax chess. We take the time to play tax chess in your favor. We give our clients unbiased, independent advice across all areas in their financial life because we have no incentive to sell anything. I was taken enough and impressed enough to have you do my work. And you have, in fact, saved me a serious amount of money. CharlesDombeck.com slash Prager. I, I knew the centrality of friends. You And you have it, by the way. I, here's another announcement. This is um, Praise Julie Day. On no. Dennis and Julie. <laughs> Embarrass Julie with praise. That's a better way of putting it. I... You can judge people by their friends and their enemies. And I don't know your enemies. I don't think you have many. You will, but I don't think you have. <laughs> I do. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you have. But I just, uh, I just want to note, every one of your friends, all female, which is the healthiest way it should be generally, I have been so impressed with, and I'll tell you what impressed in every single instance, their goodness because that's all that matters to me. They're, they were all mature. They were all bright. That but that I expect. But they were good. And um, uh, that's... So you'll, you'll always have that. that. Well, thank you so much for saying that, and I'm so proud. I, I always say to my friends that I feel so good about myself when I'm with them because they're a reflection of me. 
but I have I really do have the most amazing friends and you're right to identify the goodness because that's what I care about most I at know. the risk of sounding like Mother Teresa no, no, corny that, well, I know it's the way it sounds but I swear to you it's the I truth said what I said about it's what you. I care the most yep. about and it's what they care the most about too it's re- it's really impressive. Did you pick up the book for a I reason? I did, yeah. yes, because you were speaking about Senator Joseph Lieberman. Yes. And I just wanted to publicize this book. We we talked about it on the last Dennis and Julie, but you know, we're we're not getting any money from this. So this no, is not, not a like a Correct. not a penny. It's so worth it is so good. It's beautiful and it, it's worth it. It's one called, page arguments for God's existence. Go ahead. No, no. You you said No, no, you go ahead. But no. but give the name and everything. Elevator pitches for God and there are so many different there's jews christians muslims atheists certainly people who struggle with god physicists chemists senators a- a- all walks of life yes. alan dershowitz and Seth i didn't Dillon. even know julie was in it <laughs> did you know i was in it yeah I-, I figured you were in it yeah all right but anyway but they didn't but i love that you're in it that's amazing i'm the youngest contributor yes that's a big deal I'm is it to- hard for you to imagine if because uh. I, I I was public at your age as well, and can you imagine that one day you'll be the oldest in a book, or is it too abstract? I'm aware of it because of you. Oh, the, amplify on that. What does that mean? I believe you. It makes sense, but I'm just curious. Hmm. I'm aware of my age. I don't feel my age. I feel older than my age, honestly. Um, I mean, mentally, I just relate more. Uh, but but as you just said, I have amazing friends my age. So, but um, with you, you and I are such good friends, and we connect on such a level of equal uh, of equals. Excuse me. Um, you have a young spirit. You actually you have an ageless spirit. You, you, That's a good way of putting you, you, it. I do, and I, I know don't it. think yeah. of you as of right. as an age. However, right. I am aware because sometimes I have to remind myself that you're 75, and I'm aware that when you started, you were my age. And you always have that funny line where you say that that people used to tell you, you know, you're really good for your age, and now they still tell you you're really good for your age. So I'm I'm aware, but I never try to make my age. Um, there are two things I avoid actually. Harvard and my age. On Timeless especially. Some, it comes up more here than it does over there. But on Timeless... I, I avoid Harvard and my age too. Makes two of us. <laughs> when I started the show, I made some ground rules for myself. Like I wrote a list of ground rules. And two of them That's was I would not I, play at my age yes. and I would not play at Harvard. You're ageless. You're young. You're obviously young. I'm obviously old. But I, I'm ageless and you're ageless. No one, within two minutes, nobody's thinking of our ages, hmm. which is what it should be. I mean, that's the ideal. That That, that, that is correct. Does Does anybody think of Lincoln's age? And I'm not Lincoln, but I'm just noting. Nobody thinks of Lincoln's age. So I've got a good question for you, speaking of age. I recently interviewed the sage, Larry Elder, on my show, uh, which everyone should watch. Really, it's a great episode. We talked about you know, his gubernatorial race. We talked about Israel. We talked about uh, who he thinks Trump's VP is going to be, et cetera. But then we talked about life. And I asked him two questions. What was the hardest period in your life? And what do you wish you knew when you were my age? And so I want to ask you, I want to ask you both, but... F- because we're talking about age, let's start with the second one. What do you wish you knew when you were 24? So I know you asked him that, and I started asking myself that. It's painful because it sounds like this guy's really not in touch with himself, that I don't have an immediate answer. Why is that painful? Because it sounds arrogant. What you knew everything at twenty four? No, I don't. I don't think that's that. It doesn't strike no, me it as doesn't? arrogant. Okay. No. I, I, I really, I knew what was important at a very early age. I even wanted to get married in my twenties. I did. I didn't get married till thirty two, but I, it, it wasn't. 
I I dated a lot. I I was uh, I was a um, a ladies' man. Okay, well, whatever term you want to use, uh, which, by the way, is really a fascinating subject because I have thoughts on on those years, both positive and negative. Incidentally, which, well, Larry had an answer for me about dating, which I'll, I'll what, tell you. What was it? He said. Um, we were talking before. I had no idea who was going to bring this up on the air. But Larry, whenever he sees me, he goes, you got a boyfriend. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, why? And I said, I'm waiting for someone who's worthy of me. And I don't, I don't mean that in a self-aggrandizing no, way yeah, right, at all. Right. But it's, it's, I it's know the you tr- don't. It is the truth. I'm, I could date someone. A quality man. Yes. Um, but I'm waiting for someone who's, I, I think, really good for me. And so we were just chatting about that before the air. And then on the air, when I asked Larry that question, what he wish he knew, he paused and he said, I would make better investment decisions, like financially. And then he brought up what I said to him off the air. And he said, I would have taken your course and I would have not wasted my time in some relationships with people who were not good Which for course? me. Which course? I'm sorry. Which course he would have, would he have taken? My course of I'm I could date right now, but I'm waiting for someone who's good enough to date them. And, and Larry well, said I did, didn't do that. I dated a lot of people, or I don't know if he said a lot of people. But he said I wasted my time with people who weren't good for me. Oh. Or good enough for yeah. me. But mm-hmm. I said to him, there's also there's a downside in my approach too. If I'm being really blunt right now, there's a total downside to it. Go on. Loneliness. Well, I, I mean, I go I, on so dates. Okay, it's, I'm not like I, I at home being a I actually have a good nun. answer for you. Yeah. You would be lonelier in a bad relationship. The loneliest... I am... You know how adamant I am pro-marriage. Mm-hmm. And, and every metric married people are happier. Having said that, I don't deny the pain of a bad marriage and that's lonelier than living alone a Mm. mediocre marriage is better than no marriage in my opinion wow but a bad marriage i mean to be with someone and lonely is is worse i think than uh, being alone and lonely but you were talking about your years. That's why the only reason I brought this up is you were saying so, you have thoughts okay. on them. Yes, well, I do. But they, they'll be fun for another Dennis and Julie if you want to remember it. I'll write it so, down. So, well, I, I, I'll, I'll, give, I'll say it now. And it'll blow people's minds because they're not used to such honesty on these subjects. Oh, here we go. Yes. Well, they're used to honesty from you. Yeah, well, even from me, they're used to it, but it still blows spines. Here we go. So, I wish I had found somebody sooner. I mean, till I ultimately found the right one, I was already 50. I mean, you know, Sue. What was I? One second. So, 15, 45. Yeah. No, 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 not 45. Yeah, in my 50s. Yeah. It's a long time. 55, because Sue was 40. Okay, yeah, that's right. She had just turned 40. That's right. Okay. So that's a long time to to truly write one. And there's no bad reflection on my previous relationships. But I I wanted to marry, I, I wanted to find and fall in love with the right woman at your age. So what I did, though, was I was with a lot of women, to be perfectly honest. And I will also be perfectly honest, I really liked it. I would have preferred meeting somebody and falling in love and marrying. But if I didn't have that, this was not a terrible second place. Okay, but I want to make something... uh, This is the... That's already very big... I know. You know. Revelation. Good for you, though. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm real, if nothing else, as you know. But there, here's the interesting thing. As a result of my 20s, I never once 
in, in the rest of my life as a married man wondered, gee, what would another woman be like? Mm, that's really, really, really important. Well, wow. it is. It was for me, and mm. I think it is for most men. For men, I, for a lot I, of yes, men, that's men, more men, the case. Yes, men, the, the chase and the conquering and another woman is a big, uh, that's why there's a great saying. Men love women, women love a man. <laughs> it's, it's depressing, true. but it's true. It's true, but it's no, depressing. It is true. Yes, it is true. And and but I never for a day thought, oh boy, what would another woman be like? I had sort of sown my wild oats as a young man. But to give you credit and not yep. to be too personal, you had very principled boundaries with your Oh, physical oh, life. Oh, you mean even in my 20s? Yes. Oh, yes. You did. Uh, I, I, because I, I don't want right. you to no, no, no. make I, yourself out to be this Okay, that is correct. sleeping I, around I, person. I always believed intercourse should be reserved for marriage. Th- there's a lot other because things Because when people to do. hear that now, they, yes, th- that's, that's not, you're right. they don't know uh, you're your right approach. In, in, that's right. That was my approach. That is correct. I was with women, but I believed intercourse was for marriage. Uh, by the way, I didn't believe it for religious reasons, it, even though it's true religiously. Uh, that's why that'll be an interesting subject for us. But All subjects are interesting subjects for us. That's pretty true, isn't it? All right. Well, we'll leave everybody on that cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, well, that that is a good. Stay cliffhanger. tuned for the next. Oh yeah. Dennis and Julie. I'm going to write it down. In the meantime, you can reach me at julie at julie-hartman.com. Thank you so much for your emails. It's painful that I can't respond to all of them, but please forward them to me. If I don't respond, I'll try to. And you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Julie R. Hartman. Follow Dennis on Instagram at the Dennis Prager and on Twitter at Dennis Prager and Dennis and Julie's every Sunday right here on this YouTube channel at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Shalom. Indeed.